Welcome, welcome once again, for this is the day that the Lord has made, and indeed we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I pray, and I want to believe that the Lord has kept you safe and sound. And as we meet again today, we say that you're going to read through the book of Romans, chapter 14 to chapters number 16, making it, you know, the end of the book of the uh, of reading through the book of Romans, which is the 45th book of the Bible, and setting the pace for tomorrow to begin the 46th book, which is the first book of Corinthians, or the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. We've come a long journey. Remember we said, um, there is a, as we began to read the book of Romans, that it is um, a very strong book in regards, you know, to the gospel and the doctrines of the early church. And we've looked through the scriptures that one of the greatest themes that comes here, you know, that comes to us, you know, is, the, is you know, justification by faith, that you've been justified by faith and not by works. Remember chapter one to chapter number three, we dealt with the issue of the sinful nature in man. Chapter four and chapters number five, we looked at how man is justified by God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. When putting your faith in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And chapters number six, all through to chapters number 16, we, we, shall, we, we have been seen you know, uh, uh, until chapter number 13 yesterday, and of course 14 and 15 and 16 to the end of this uh, book of Romans, we have seen how the Apostle Paul has taken time to teach those who have been justified by faith in regards of how they're going to live their Christian life. And so we finish off that part today uh, from chapters number 14 to chapters number 16, and we shall hear how what uh, the Holy Spirit has to teach and instruct us today in regards uh, to the scriptures. Why don't you begin with the word of prayer? Father, we come before you once again today. We honor you, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity that you've just granted us to be in your presence today as we read through your holy writ. I pray that Jehovah Father, as we come with expectation that none of us will leave this place the same way they came, as we read through your word, we shall be energized, we shall be rebuked, we shall be corrected, we shall be encouraged, we shall be instructed, we shall be led, and we shall be built up in our most holy faith. And so we pray that through the person of the Holy Spirit, this shall become a reality in our hearts. And as we live throughout your word, that we shall bear fruit that are consistent to a life that has been justified by faith in your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose mighty name we do trust, pray, and believe. Amen. Romans chapter number 14, verses 1, Paul continues to teach us how to live out our justified Christian's life. Reveal, receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to despise over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. <laughs> when we talk about weak here, we're not talking about physically physical weaknesses. We're talking about uh, weakness in regards of faith. Remember, uh, the Roman Empire is a uh, the Rome Rome by itself. It's a cosmopolitan, you know, city, and people of all diverse, you know languages and nations and uh, tribes are finding their residence there. And people, you know, uh, have got this issue of, um, you know, eating food uh, 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 and, 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 and that is offered to idols. So there are those who in a week in faith, they say, I'll just eat vegetables because it is the custom of many people to slaughter and offer the, 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 the animal fast to their own diverse gods. And so because they're called weak, because um, they tend to think that their food will damage their relationship with, with God. So Paul says those who are strong, yes, they can eat anything. But those who feel that their faith can be tampered with or their relationship can be tampered with in, uh, by, 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 by what they eat, then these people are weak in their faith. And so he says whether you're strong or weak in your faith, don't start bringing judgment and we shall see how, uh, uh, I mean, how the scripture scriptures bring this so vividly. So let him who eats this, let him who eats despise him who does not eat. Let not him, sorry, who eats despise him who does not eat. And let him not, and let not him who does, who does 
not eat, touch him who eats, for God has received him. So don't judge one another. If your faith is strong and you can eat anything, don't call the one who is who is not eating meat. Call them you, 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 you have weak faith. How come? How come you think that you, what you eat shall damage your relationship with God? Don't start talking about one another like that. So who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls indeed. He will be made to stand for God is able to make him stand. Stop judging one another. None belongs to you. Both of you, you are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ and he shall judge you accordingly when that, fit, when that uh, faithful day uh, uh, comes. Five, one person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. Uh, to, uh, to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat, to the Lord, he does not eat and give God thanks. He says, the one who has faith, he eats everything, saying, I give God thanks because he has provided this. And I give God thanks because I'm not justified by works. Neither am I justified by what I eat. I'm justified because I've put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the one who does not eat, does not eat because they give God thanks. And they say, God, I thank you because in reality, I'm not going to eat any food that I perceive or I believe or I sus suspect that has been offered to the idol. So these two people, they're doing that because they love God and they want to please God. And so he continues to say this, for if we... Uh, uh, verse 7, for none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, and that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. So Paul is saying, whatever you do, we all do it under the revelation and the insight that you are doing it to our God. So stop judging one another because at the end of the day, all of us will be judged by one judge. Who owns us? For every knee shall bow before him, and every tongue shall confess before him. And as we do that, when you live your life like that, listen, you will not be bothered so much about what others do or what others don't do. When you come to Philippians, you'll discover Paul tells in chapter number two, the church in Philippians, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do. This does not mean negate your responsibility of brotherly love to one another. It does not mean be insensitive to the needs of others or be blind to the needs of others. No. What the Apostle Paul is trying to tell us this in regards of how somebody is living out their faith. Don't be a judger of them. Don't judge them. Work out fast your faith. Know this, that you know all of us will stand before God. All of us will stand before the righteous judge and he shall indeed judge us. So whether you feel your faith is strong or, or your faith is weak or, or somebody's faith is weak and yours is strong, no, no matter how you feel, the Apostle Paul tells us this, don't start judging one another. It is in that light that he says, don't judge one another. Let your faith be your faith. Work out your salvation with fear and tremble. Let the other one work out their salvation with fear and tremble. With the realization and the understanding that all of us will stand before God in in, uh, in that in that in that faithful day. So don't don't be bothered so much. Don't let your faith be determined by what others do. Be focused. If you think it is right for you to eat meat, you eat. If you think it's right just for you to eat vegetables, eat. Don't start looking down upon one another in judgment, for God is the judger of us all. Verses 14. No, 
I now I, I know and I'm convinced that by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he, for he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. So what does Paul teach here in general? He's teaching us that don't let what you have believed and your brother is not comfortable with, don't use that to provoke your brother to anger. Something that the Apostle Peter writes and he says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Why? Because fathers may have knowledge that the children do not have. And you may use that knowledge to provoke the younger person or the weaker person. So Paulia uses the same uh, you know, analogy. He's teaching us this. A, hey, if you're comfortable in eating meat, and your brother is not comfortable in eating meat, don't come with that sumptuous, you know, uh, piece of rib, you know, and tell your brother, you mean you miss this? How yummy it is, and yet I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're missing this? Don't do that. Don't offend your brother. Don't provoke your sister. Don't provoke somebody. Paul says, if, you're, if, you're, if your faith is stable in what you're doing, don't use it negatively against that who is struggling with it. And he says, this is what counts when all is said and done. This is what he says, for the kingdom of God, verse 17, is not about eating and drinking. Don't make them, the minors become the majors. Don't major on the minors and forsake the majors. For these are the minors. What you eat and what you drink is the least in God's kingdom. And then what are the majors? He says, these are the majors. Joy in the whole. It says, uh, 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 righteousness, number one. Peace, number two, and joy in the Holy Spirit. When you're serving God in the, revel in, the, in the light of these three things, what is he saying? For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. There is no issue with somebody who walks in righteousness. There'll be no offense with somebody who walks in the joy of the Holy Spirit. There'll be no offense in somebody who walks in peace. So if I live in righteousness and I come before a brother or a sister who eats meat and another the one who does not eat meat, if I relate with them in the service of God through righteousness, through peace, and through joy in the Holy Spirit, who will be who will feel offended? There is no one who will feel offended. So Paul is telling us: live in the reality of those three things. Live your life in that reality of those three things. For this you shall be both acceptable to God and approved by men. Verses 19. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Underline that. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good, it is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what, in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. Underline that anything that you do in your life that is not propelled by faith before God, it is a sin. Chapter 15 verses 1. We then who are strong ought to bear with the, with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let, let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification, for even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. For whatever things were written before, before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now, may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another, 
according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is telling us this, follow the pattern of Christ. Follow the pattern of Christ. Be an example. Be an example. Accommodate the weak. That's why, you know, the Pharisees will say that Christ, mm, if you are a true teacher, if you are a true prophet, you know that you're walking with sinners. You know that you have entered into a sinner's house. Christ was accommodative so that he can win all. And that's why the Apostle Paul writes and he says, to the Greeks, I become a Greek. To the Romans, I become a Roman. To the Gentile, I become a Gentile for the sake of winning them all. So Paul was accommodative. He was not transformed by them. He was not pulled by them. But he used that scenario in that moment man carrying himself to know that what? That is the instrument or the tool that God will use to reach out to the Greeks, to reach out to the Gentiles, to reach out to the Jews. And so he accommodated them so that he can be able to transmit to them by preaching and by example the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So Paul is telling us, follow after the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 7, therefore, receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumstances, uh, that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to, for, to confirm the promises made to the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written. For this reason, I will confess to you among the Gentiles. I'll confess to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, O you Gentiles, loud him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and, who, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him, the Gentiles shall hope. Now, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may, be, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul tells the Gentiles and together with the Jews, let us all glorify God together. Don't just glorify God because you're a Jew or just don't glorify your, your God because just you are a Gentiles. For all of you, you are in the plans of God. And he quotes those scriptures to try, when you look at this scripture, look it at the angle that he's trying to tell, uh, you know, the Jews that listen, these Gentiles have also got a responsibility or have got uh, the right to glorify God because it was in the plan, it was in the agenda, it was in the programming of God that the Gentiles can come to him through the Lord Jesus Christ. So let us all glorify God for all. We've got the right and the responsibility to respond in God with thanksgiving and praise because all of us are candidates of the seven grace that God has revealed to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And we all have hope, you know, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Verses 14. Now, I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with the knowledge filled with all knowledgeable, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God. What is that grace? That I may be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have no reason to glorify, uh, therefore I have no, I have reason, sorry, to glorify in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed, to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. Remember this, the Apostle Paul is writing in Corinthians, and we shall see in Corinthians when Paul tells them that I did not come to you with the eloquence of word, neither did I come to you with wisdom of men, but I came to you with the demonstration of power and the Holy Spirit. He discovered when he was in, a, when he was in, uh, in Athens, we saw it is it in uh, chapter 17 or chapter 19 of the book of Acts, when he tried to bring in a philosophical, you know, uh, you know, uh, preaching there, 
and you know, concerning their known God, he got few converts. But when he landed in Corinthians, he didn't take chances. He came in the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. So he tells them, my ministry has been accredited that I've been able to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, not denying them the demonstration of the power that comes through the impartation of the Holy Spirit. So that from Jerusalem and around to Elycrium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And so I have made it an aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see. And those who have not heard shall understand. So he's telling them, I was laboring not to go where others have preached. I wanted virgin ground. That's what he said. I was trying to say, I wanted virgin ground. Where the, the gospel of Christ has not been preached, that's where I wanted to go. And that has been my ambition, verses 22. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, but now, no longer having a place in these parts and coming to you, and having a great desire that these many years are to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. So Paul is telling them, I plan to come towards Spain and I want to pass, to pass through Rome. And for, uh, you know, uh, for I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you. If first I may enjoy your company for a while. But now I am going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. Verses 26, for it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty also is to minister to them in material things. You know, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 6, Paul, you know, teaches this to that church in Gal in, 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 in uh, in Galatia, and he tells them, "Listen, if I've ministered to you physical, uh, material, uh, uh, spiritual things, then you have a responsibility to respond to me with physical, uh, with physical or material stuff." So the same principle here is talking to this church in Rome. In Rome, and he's telling them, "I plan." to go to Spain, and as I plan to go to Spain, I plan to come and be with you for some time, encourage you, preach to you, and you will assist me, of course, materially in my journey to go to Spain. And so he quotes the church in Macedonia and Achaia that they were given to the Apostle Paul. They felt uh, you know, indebted, knowing very well that the Apostle Paul wants to go to Jerusalem. You know, they felt indebted that you know, the, 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 the church in Jerusalem released Paul. We saw it in Acts chapter number 13, where the church was ministering before God in prayer and in fasting. And, you know, the Holy Spirit said, set aside for me Paul and Barabbas and Saul for the work of ministry that I have for them. So it is through that commissioning that the Paul went all to all these churches. And so the church in Macedonia and the church in Achaia, they were so generous to tell Paul, do you know what? As you go back to Jerusalem, carry these gifts as well with you. And when you look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, I know we shall come to that. But let us just look it in a brief. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, verses 1. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. So the Apostle Paul is telling the Corinthians, we've sent Titus there in advance. Let you be aware of the grace that was upon the Macedonian church. They were in trials, they were in tribulations, they were in poverty. They, when the Bible says in extreme poverty, it is extreme poverty. They, they had no reason to give, but out of that extreme poverty, out of that affliction, out of that tribulation, out of that trial, they begged Paul 
to give, to receive their gifts. So Paul is telling the Corinthians that I've also sent Titus there ahead of you, ahead of me. Respond to him in the same manner that the Macedonian church responded. The Corinthians church was a wealthy church, both spiritually and physically, because Corinth was a, was a business hub, you know, by that time. So Paul is telling the believers, you are more blessed than the Macedonian church. I wish that you could respond to, 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 to the need of the church in Jerusalem in the same manner. And you know, this is something that uh, 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 I get astonished by God because... These are Gentiles, the Corinthians, the Macedonians, they are Gentiles. Yet, God is, as, as, as created a scenario or is using that season when the Jews and you, 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 you know, Jews in Jerusalem are in deep poverty and they're, they're in deep need and is letting now help come from the churches in, from the Gentile world to minister to them, you know, materially, to minister to them. And that's, you know, uh, something that, you know, <laughs> can provoke you to think, how come we are telling these Gentiles that they, should, they cannot be born again unless they are circumcised? They cannot be born again unless this and this happens? Yet they are responding to us with their material things out of love because they see us as brothers together with them, because of what Christ has done in their lives. So Paul is telling the Roman church, listen, I'm passing there. And I also want you to support me in my ministry as I go towards, you know, Spain. And we have a lot of issues in the modern church today. Believers want to be fed spiritually, but they don't want to give back material things. We are not more spiritual than the apostle Paul was. The modern church is not more spiritual than the early church. If Paul needed financial support from the church in Rome, from the church in Macedonia, from the church in Hakaya, from the church in Philippines, in, 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 in Philippi, you know, that's where we get the common scripture, Philippians 4.19, that my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. That scripture stands there because there is another scripture before that that says, there is no church that stood with me in matters of giving and receiving as you did. And now my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. So these churches stood with the apostle Paul because the work of God needed resources. The work of God needed resources. And he pulls it through those who love him. Part of, part of a, a person who gives, who gives to the work of God, this person is addicted to the kingdom of God. He understands that the kingdom of God to progress, number one, I need to participate in it. In prayer, thy kingdom come, the will be done. Thy kingdom come, the will be done. Number two, who I must participate in it in reaching out to those who are around me and I must participate in my giving as well, materially. So Paul labors to tell the Romans, prepare, and I want you to follow the pattern of the church in Macedonia and in Achaia. To make certain, uh, of course, we've read the verses 30. Let us go on verses 30. It says, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. So the Apostle Paul tells them, I prepare this journey to go to Jerusalem. Pray that I may go in one piece because mm, I understand what is happening there. Remember, at the house of um, Philip the Evangelist who had for our virgin daughters who prophesied. Agbas came there. You know, we read the story and he took the belt of Paul and he put, you know, uh, he, he tied himself and he says, the person who owns this belt under this manner shall be uh, shall, shall, shall be tied when he goes to, to, to Jerusalem. And the people tried, you know, to tell the Apostle Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. We saw, we saw this. Yet the Apostle Paul says, I must go. And they said, nevertheless, let the will of God be done. So Paul is praying. He's asking for prayers from the church in Rome to stand with him in prayer. We don't know if they did it because 
uh, we understand how the plan went. It was in the he, it was in the plan of God for Paul to go to get arrested, and by that he found uh, the way to find himself in Rome, and from there for two years he stayed in the church in Rome, preaching from his rented house as a prisoner with a soldier uh, there, and from there a lot of letters. Uh, 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 or episodes came from the Apostle Paul. So here there is a principle. The Apostle Paul teaches the Roman church as well as we uh, in the modern church that believers have got a responsibility to stand in the gap and pray for the spiritual authorities. If you love your pastor, before you give, pray for him. Pray for her. If you love your apostle, before you give that seed, pray for them. Stand in the gap for them. Pray that, you know, they, 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 they will continue steadfastly. They will not give up in the preaching of the gospel. They will not let bitterness and rage and such things enter their hearts. Pray that they shall stand the test of time. Pray that they shall find access to the grace of God to operate in the gifts of the Spirit because if they operate in the gifts of the Spirit, it shall be to your benefit. Pray that they shall handle the word of God in a sober manner because if they don't handle the word of God in a sober manner, they will really lead you to heresy. Pray that they shall be sober in the handling of scriptures. They shall be sober in handling people of the opposite sex. They shall be sober, you know, in handling finances. Praise be the name of the living God. They shall be sober in their attitude. Hallelujah. Pray, because yes, these men, they're spiritual authority, but they're not spirits, they're men. Pray for us. Instead of talking ill and negative concerning the servants of God over your life, pray for them that they may be perfect as you think you are perfect, of which you are not. It is that we have a responsibility to pray for our spiritual authority or leaders as well. Chapter number 16, verses 1. I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in, 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 in Centuria, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of you for indeed she has been a helper of many and of myself also can you live like phoebe when your spiritual leader knows that you've gone to a certain city he can write or she can write a letter and say receive this lady receive this man because they have been a help to me and they're good characters you know they are good. we've got a good testimony with with them Three, great Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ, who risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house, Priscilla and Aquila, and Aquilas, they are pillars in the life and the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Of course, they left Rome to go to Corinth, uh, you know, after... Um, can't remember the name of that church history, church history, of that Roman Empire, you know, uh, that came, was it Nero? It was before Nero. That Roman Empire, I can't remember his name, Holy Spirit, remind me. That he came and, uh, you know, he started persecuting Christians before the, the, the bad Nero came in. And so it is through that time that Priscilla and Aquila had to move from Rome and begin to sojourn, uh, 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 to go and sojourn in, in Corinth. And, um, you know, the Apostle Paul is indebted to them. He says, man, greet that couple for me. And also all the churches of the Gentiles, because you know, you know that very well. Most of them were hospitable to him, even including, you know, Corinthians that he had a bond to pick with. And we shall see it when he come there. Greet my beloved Epanitas, what a name, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Andronicus and Junior, my countrymen, and my fellow prisoners who are of the note who are of not among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amplias, what a name, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Abanas, what a name, our fellow worker in Christ. And Stachis, my beloved. Greet Apelles, approved in Christ. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. Greet Erodian, my countryman. Greet those who are in the household of Acacias. 
Uh, na, na, Narcissus, who are in the Lord, greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, what names, who have labored in the Lord. Forget about the name, but remember these people have labored in the Lord. Greet my beloved Peri, uh, uh, Persis, who labored much in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Greet Asyncritus, uh, Phlegon, Hamas, uh, 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 Amas, Patrobas, Ames, and the brethren who are with them. Greet Philologus, what a name, and Julia, Nereus, and his uh, sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Now I urge you, brethren, not those who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. It says avoid any person who brings controversy, avoid any person who brings discord, avoid any person who brings division. For those who are such do not serve the Lord Jesus. Are you a person who brings strife? Are you a person who brings division? Are you a person who makes brothers not see eye to eye together? You are not in the service of the Lord. And if you're not in the service of the Lord, you are definitely in the service of the devil. So these people don't serve Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. The God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, and Sosipata, my countrymen, greet you. I, Tatia, so he tells you was the secretary as Paul was speaking these words. I, Tatias, who wrote this episode, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, my host and the host of the old church, greet you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. And Quartas, a brother. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and to preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mysteries kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. To God alone, wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. What a way to finish. He wants the Roman church to know that in all that you do, be obedient to the command of God. Because so have I come to preach to you, to bring you the hidden mysteries of God that were hidden from the foundations of the earth. They have been made plain in your generation that you may walk in obedience. Remember very well that as you read through the scriptures, one thing God wants you to do, the primary thing is this, to believe and to obey what you read. That's by doing that, you're fulfilling righteousness before the living God. Amen. What a journey that has been for us, that we've come to the end of the 45th book of the Bible, that is the book of Romans, very rich in doctrinal teachings in regards to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to believe that it has been a blessing to you as it has been to me as well. Keep on commenting, keep on encouraging us, let us know where you need you know, help. Any questions that come forth, we shall be able to get back to you. And for Kingdom Advancement, given the numbers are appearing there on your script screen if you want to be a partner with us you're welcome to do so and you shall indeed partake of the blessings that have restored in this ministry in the name of jesus christ so see you tomorrow as we begin the 46th book which is the book of first corinthians or the first letter of paul to the church in corinth may the lord watch over you and may the lord keep you shalom thank you